Welcome to the smartest people in the room. We are so glad that you are here with us. And just by showing up, you're already demonstrating your very own smarts. Today, we continue our celebration of Women's History Month by featuring one of the most interesting women we've ever met, someone who's worn so many cool and diverse hats in the industry. Before we get started, let me take care of some business. First, to the audience, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. The reason we do these webinars is twofold. First, we want to showcase really smart people and the amazing work they do day to day in the music industry. But the second reason is a bit more nuanced. Many of you know that I am a music industry headhunter. I place music executives in roles throughout the industry. So by definition and function, I help people connect with companies. In this series, my goal is to help you make more connections and I invite you to take full advantage of that opportunity. Specifically, I invite you to engage with the speakers and the other attendees in the chat of the Zoom. Please introduce yourselves, share your LinkedIn profile, say hello to your friends and make some new ones and ask questions of our speakers. We will try to address as many of those as possible during the session. Also, please make sure your chat is set to address speakers and attendees. Before we really get going, let me thank our sponsors for without their support, we couldn't keep this free. I wanna thank First Horizon Bank, Buffkin Baker, Four Roses Bourbon, the Fairlane Hotel, the Tennessee Entertainment Commission, Lightning 100, Tennessee Brew Works, Moo TV, Jive Printing, Project Music, and Cushmasters brand of CBD products. So let's get the party started. In today's host seat, we welcome back my good friend, Kevin Cassini. Kevin is a well-known, very well-respected enter entertainment attorney in New Haven, Connecticut, where he has been recognized by New England super lawyers for his work in litigation, copyright, and trademarks. His consulting company, Echo Artist Services, maintains a talented client roster of artists, writers, producers, and DJs. He also teaches copyright, music law, and entertainment law at Quinnipiac University. Kevin is a member of the Recording Academy, Music Biz, the Copyright Alliance, the Americana Music Association, and serves on the nominating committee for the Boston Music Awards and the board of CT Folk, the 30-year-old folk and roots music festival held each summer in New Haven. Welcome back, Kevin. Great to see you, brother. And joining Kevin as today's special guest is Molly Newman. Molly is president of Song Trust, the world's largest global royalty collection service and music publishing administrator. As president, she leads the company's day-to-day -day operations, global expansion, and royalty collection innovations. Under her leadership, the platform has grown to represent more than 300,000 songwriters, 2 million songs, and thousands of music companies, including publishers, distributors, and record labels. Prior to joining Song Trust, Molly was head of music at Kickstarter, she was inter interim president and VP of the American Association of Independent Music, A2IM, and held senior roles in label relations at Rhapsody International and eMusic. She's on the advisory boards of the Music Business Association, Women in Music, and previously served on the boards of Sound Exchange and A2IM. She was recognized on Billboard's 2020 and 2019 Women in Music list, and the 2018 Digital Power Players list. Her career in music began as the drummer in Riot Girl, band called Bratmobile. And as a personal note, let me simply say that I will never forget the phone call I received from Joe Conyers, <laughs> who I guess might be her boss at Song Trust. Joe was giddy the day that they inked the deal to bring you into the company. I've, I've never heard an executive gush more about hiring an executive than Joe did the day they hired you, Molly. So welcome, both of you. I'm delighted that you're here and take it away, Kevin. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. That's very sweet. And hi to all of our friends, which is awesome. It's great yeah, to see all so of you, Katina. Cool people. That tune. Thank you all for tuning in, got my students from law school here. And uh, yes, you are very accomplished in the executive world, but that's not where I want to begin. We can end up there. <laughs> okay. um, but I want to begin with you in Washington, D.C., because you're one of those rare animals that actually is from D.C. Yes, I was born there in the city at Georgetown University Hospital. And I graduated high school 
from what it, uh, Washington International School, and we lived in the city. My parents moved to Maryland eventually, but um, which a lot of people live outside of the city. But yeah, we yeah, lived in the them. in the uh, actual city, not just in the Beltway, in the district. <laughs> right. <itself. laughs> and your dad was working on political campaigns. So my dad originally, we moved to Washington when he worked for a congressman from the East Bay of California. He's from, my dad's from Oakland and he, um, so shout out Christina Zafiros from Oakland in the house here. Um, and he worked for a congressman named Jerry Waldy and we moved to, um, so I was born in Washington when he worked for him. And then Jerry Waldy ran for governor and lost. And we moved back to California for that campaign and then when he lost, we moved back and he uh, began to work for a congressman um, from Arizona named Mo Udall, who was the chairman of the interior committee for many years and um, ran for president in 76. And um, so and Mo is a sort of a giant in the congressional history. And it's very hard to see the environment that you know has sort of manifest in Washington in the last 20 years, because you know, you know, I did have some visibility um, into a, a, I would say a more gentlemanly time. Um, certainly there weren't that many women um, in, in office, but, um, but there was more decorum. And so, you know, right. it is, it's difficult to see, but he, yeah, he had many jobs. He ended up working uh, for Carter um, and then for the DNC and back for Mo and, you know, sort of had a, a meandering um, uh, career in Washington, but that was very transformational. And it, I mean, that transformational foundational for me um, to sort of, to be in that environment. Right. So, you know, rubbing the elbows and shooting the proverbial shit is not foreign to you. You got used to that. <laughs> you know, it, well, my parents split up when I was pretty young and, um, we so the day the night that I was with my dad he would like cart me around to all the like when you're a staffer in congress you you have to go to lots of um cocktail parties that people pay a lot of money for to host and hope that a member will turn up and when I was at HYM I, my, I flipped the script because we hosted some um events and you know we're like desperate for members to show up and it was great when they would um and but it was very interesting to think about me being like a seven-year-old, you know, in the corner drinking a Shirley Temple, waiting for my dad to stop, you know, yapping with all of his his people. Sure. Um, but I had to talk to people like as a seven-year-old, like, oh, Molly, because I was there every week. Um, and well, you're so I, while you're there. <laughs> I mean, I was just learning how to talk to adults. So I, I do think Work that that room. has been a transferable skill um, in my life. Well, it's funny that you're so skilled in talking to adults because you find yourself in the music industry where we're most, we're mostly <laughs> children anyway. So I'm not sure well, that yeah, necessarily transfers. Yeah. Don't want to be rude, so, but uh, yeah. <laughs> you're you're in D.C. and I don't know how long, uh, how old you were when you when you moved, maybe college, but at your time in D.C., is that where the 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 punk got its its fangs into you? Because the D.C. punk scene is legendary. Yeah, um, sort of explosion? peripherally, sort of peripherally. I wasn't, um, I didn't go to shows when I was in high school. Um, it was like really? a little, you know, the 80s, it was a little bit rough and the the, the venues and, and mm -hmm. stuff were downtown and it was a little bit different. I didn't really have permission to do all of that. And I went to a smallish right. school. So, you know, that was a little bit isolated, but oddly when I went to college in Oregon, um, and one of my colleagues from Songtrust, um, who's on the call or on, on the meeting is also a U of O, um, he graduated there. I, I didn't end up graduating from there, but, um, went there as well. Uh, my next door neighbor in the dorms was from a town called Olympia, Washington. And there was a very strong sort of the person who runs the, like the, the label in town in Olympia had lived in DC for a while. He had been, he's a little older than me. He had sort of been a part of the original DC punk scene. And there was just like a very, a cross pollination. Um, so ironically, I got much more into DC music when I went to school, when I went home 
on like, you know, breaks and stuff, I would go to sure. shows and I didn't really know anybody yet. So I just go by myself and kind of be like this weird person. Sometimes I would get up the strength to what? like, introduce myself and like hey I love your band um and then those are like some of my best friends now which is you know a big gift um but but sort of a funny circumstance and don't have to ask permission when you're back home from college on break right you can just go <laughs> I was able to drive and I knew about I think it was like an a issue of access which is hard for some people to like gr grasp is so we are so we have so much information and so many details at our disposal in infinite ways now but like i just didn't know about things and so i'm sure oh my God. if i had you're right you know i like had to read the city paper and look at see who was playing and it was late and you know and you know all of the sort of sort of barriers to entry how much work went into it yeah, so and, and DC didn't have out. great radio, um, you know, like uh, WFMU is in College Park, Creed University of Maryland, but that didn't have a great transmitter and um, WHFS um, in the 80s was more Baltimore and Maryland kind of coverage. So like you could get it, but it was harder. Like literally, I know this is hard to imagine people, some of you, some of you totally not, um, but you know, to dial in to hear those songs in certain genres was much, much more difficult. So a lot of what I was into musically was pop and R&B. Obviously, R&B is the, you know, huge, um, you know, hugely important in DC. And so that's like my foundation in music really did have a pretty broad spectrum. Wait, um, they don't play R&B though in DC. What do they call it? Go. Well, they have go-go, but the, the, the mainstream radio stations certainly did. Oh, sure. National <laughs> R&B, you know, top yeah. 40. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. That. But go-go uh, is the like, is the local, you know, indigenous genre, if you will. Like it is like a real, yeah, totally. and it's hard. It, it when I was true. at HYM again, I was able to connect with the woman who runs the label for, she ran the label for Chuck Brown, who's the godfather of go-go and he passed away. Um, yeah. And then she was representing EU, um, which was probably the one band that ever had the big hit from 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 Go Go um, doing the book. Mm -hmm. And they uh, um, yes. and they were so this was I guess 2015, and they had an invitation to play South by Southwest, and they had never really toured. Um, and this is like a it's a it's a pretty wild, you know, a very physical local genre you know like the stores in town and in baltimore and you know other communities like that's where you could find the the, the tapes originally um then the cds and so we, yeah we became i don't think i ever got her to become a member which was fine but i did talk to her and try to see any way that i could help um isn't that funny <laughs> so I, I I put a link to that song in the chat on Spotify. I would have loved to have played a bunch of music today, but I don't want to get Tom and his YouTube channel in trouble. And uh, <laughs> there's plenty of people in the chat that would call me out for it because I I go far to make sure I, I recognize and respect rights and proper licenses. So uh, the links are there for everybody to go listen to properly. Um, awesome. Thank you. But yeah, that, that song got to suburban Philadelphia where I'm from because we were in middle school uh, dances trying to get people to play that song. You know, the, the teachers didn't want that played, but we could get a couple bars in before we would stop it. Uh, right. So that was a pretty big. Um, it was, so, it was. So how do you, how do you get from, from Maryland, the DC area out West? It's for college, yeah? Yeah, so I went to college, um, I, in at the University of Oregon, I was a sort of a theater kid in uh, all the plays in high school, and was that was my first ambition was to be an actor. So, the summer before I went to my my senior year in high school, I went and did a program at the Shakespeare Festival in Ashland, Oregon, and um, and sort of got the bug for that area. Like I it, and also kind of exposed to a much more hippie literally like crystals and other sort of things that just like I didn't again I didn't have much um exposure to um in the in the past and so I 
I had wanted to go to the West Coast. When my dad is born and raised in Oakland, I, I knew that I kind of wanted to be in California. And the school that I applied to, I didn't get into. And I, my second choice was, I think I my second choices were between University of Arizona and University of Oregon. And at the last minute, I decided to go to Oregon because I, I didn't think I could handle the heat. And um, even though it's dry heat, I know. But I just, I was like really afraid of it. And I, I think that was ultimately the best decision because so many sort of fortuitous things happened just because of who I met in my next, you know, who was my, my next door neighbor at the dorms. She became my um, roommate, she, my best friend. We started yeah. our band together. Um, and yeah. also, you know, the, so I, had, I, I went into college sort of, you know, also being very focused on um, the, the discipline was ethnic studies was the name of, you know, for when you would learn about um, African-American studies and, and black studies and Chicano studies that was sort of lumped into one discipline. And that was sort of my sub interest at the time. And through that, I became um, exposed to women's studies. It's kind of ironically, like I had really no feminist consciousness explicitly when I went to college and um, through sort of like the, like a couple little you know, circuits clicking on like, oh, this is another system that is limiting opportunity. Let me learn about that. So I started mm -hmm. to do um, um, women's studies courses and sociology and trying to sort of like connect all of those political historical dots together. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was the other thing that kind of like, I just didn't have that visibility when I was growing up. Um, I had many, many women um, figures in my life that I had like a lot of inspiration from. And I had some, some great um, examples that I've, uh, I still look to for inspiration, but I didn't have anyone who was like an overt feminist who was sort of like, like I said, explicitly talking about issues of, you know, right. Um, women and and so that sort of also connected then. So you're you don't realize it at this point, but you're kind of by nature an organizer and uh, you know, a room worker, so to speak. <laughs> your, right, your maybe not having DNA. that like self description, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and and what take us through time period? You're living in the Pacific Northwest. This is like the house on days that Portlandia harkens back to, right? This is this yeah is before late. I think. <laughs> and so, what year do you move up there, and, and and you transfer from Oregon to a much smaller university? Yeah, so I graduated what from the Evergreen State College, and um, I graduated a little early in December of '92, and then I moved down to to the East Bay. Um, which also had like its own very established punk scene and um, right. community. And I sort of started to, um, you know, I, I was, I knew about it, had some connection to it through fanzines and, and things like that, but had, you know, I ended up moving there and um, that was definitely a different environment because Olympia is so small and DC is relatively small in a different way. Um, and the Bay Area had a lot of sort of sub communities, uh, you know, people in San Francisco, mm -hmm. people in Berkeley, people, you know, and so sort of navigating that. But I was still, I was had started playing band in my bands and touring. And so moving to the East Bay, I was kind of like started there as a hub, like this is where my staff is. I'm going to tour. Um, and I did that for the first year out of college. So all of 93, I was pretty much touring. And then, um, I realized like that it's like I had no money. I mean, literally like so busted broke. Um, did not want to borrow money from my parents or ask for anything. And I just was like, okay, let me stabilize this situation and, um, you know, get a job. And so I got a job at my first proper, like send my application in and get, you know, do an interview and get accepted. I worked at a biotech company um, as a receptionist and shipping manager and did accounts payable and accounts receivable and all sorts of, you know, things that you need to know about when you're running a small business. Um, 
and I was vegetarian. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really like, I, I wasn't super comfortable with the work, but I was like, so, you know, after a while, this is about 1994, which was also the year that Green Day's Stooky was released. I think it just came, I think it, mm -hmm. this is like the anniversary month or something around now. Um, and by August, you know, things were just exploding and the catalog um, for their first two records was on lookout um, and that was my boyfriend at the time worked there and I was sort of like, what are you guys doing? Like, you don't even know how to, you know, organize invoices and this, you know, sort of like, I, I just was very like, what, you don't, this is chaos. The room was like this size, there were like four guys working in this room. And I, I, I sort of made a case for them hiring me. And um, I started working there in about September of 1994. So that was right after Green and Day. Lockdown. Yeah, at Lookout Records. And that was right when Woodstock 94 had happened. And that was, I think, sort of sure. like the real catalyst for them. Like, you know, the first single had come out, it was doing great, like they were doing great, but there was like that moment where they just sort of exploded. And then yeah. punk kind of exploded, especially this pop punk genre kind of world. Sure. And a lot of the other artists on the label, you know, were selling and selling well, but they were, look at how no, like, you know, proudly didn't do any promotion, what you called promo, which was like anything you wanted it to be, right? Um, press, radio, buying an ad. Um, and so that was my job. I was promo. So, I mean, obviously it worked, <laughs> especially for Green Day. Um, but yeah, I didn't work with Green band. Day. They were already on reprise, so we were just managing their first two records in the in the catalog, and that you had the first, was a, you know, like it had a lot third, of resonating right. so, impact. But yeah. let's talk about your band for a second, because okay. uh, being Women's History Month, yes, uh, your band kind of is more than just a band, right? Talk to me about the formation of Bratmobile, which is a great name for a band, uh, with two middle fingers in the eyes of establishment, so to speak. Um, how did that come to pass? You said that there's a lot of that had to accidentally fall into place. For yeah, all I mean, I, I think like the, the intentionality, like the middle finger in the eyes, like, I don't, I think we were just literally like, that's cool. That seems like a cool name, you know, come the, we were, you know, in our first and second year of school, not really just you know want we just figured that there was a path for for there weren't that many people who were women in bands um you know sure. like that was obvious um so you would go to shows you would go to record stores you would listen to radio or what, whatever it was and you just or you know, look at magazines like you just didn't see enough so that was enough for us Why to be like though? this Why? sucks and we should just try to why shouldn't we start a band? And the music that our community was sort of known for was, it was just like, you could do it. You know, it was, their melodies are real and the rhythms are real, but they're accessible. And you, there was nothing you hear in those songs that were like the most inspiring to me that I didn't think we could find some inspiration from and so that was sort of like well if we don't observe this the state that we want to see also with you know a lot of those the things that we were studying and learning about in school and as an as inspiration like well we should just do it like what is the what's the barrier our own fear or lack of a model and there certainly was a lack of a model so we had to you know sort of create that did you know how to play an instrument before you started a band? I went to college with an acoustic guitar, very um, stereotypically. Um, I were, used my summer job money to to buy that guitar. It was acoustic, and I took some like lessons at school. And then um, I think by my second year, I I traded it in, sold it for a uh, a. Um, I know Tom. You mentioned I saw the Stuart Copeland. You know he's running around his drum room. I do have the guitar, but it's in my daughter's closet, so I can't get it out. But I, I got a Fender, a Fender Music Master, which is a three-quarter size, one mm -hmm. single pickup. Um, and 
very like easy to play. Um, and it, I think it was like $250. It's like, I think it's a 65 music master. It's probably worth the money a little bit. And, um, and so I, I, about my second year of school, I started like really trying to play um, electric guitar. And that was, I didn't really have my eyes on drums until about six months later when we had started our band and I had been playing guitar. We had someone else playing with us. There are a lot of details, Kevin, that I don't think we can probably dive into, <laughs> but, but the cut sure. to, by the time we really started playing in, in Bratmobile, we had someone playing drums for us. And then she's like, she's actually had to go to Connecticut. And she was like, I got to go to Connecticut to paint this house. I can't play the show. And I was like, we were like, who can play the drums? Okay, I'll do it. And so that was sort of the pivot and it really? ended up being the instrument that was the most natural um those early days were not i mean they were still pretty rough but i it came to me more naturally so at that point you're a two-piece or do you replace yourself we have a we have a, we have a there are three of us mm -hmm. and now you were booking yourself onto bills or you're just playing house shows or how are you I mean, yeah, you out there? pretty much like, yeah, you, we had a friend in New York, a, a person named Taewon Yu, who's, um, has a band called Kicking Giant, and he gave us our first show in New York. So we were in DC for the summer. We had been pen pals. Um, he was, he was like, oh, come up and play. So we went and played um, the Spiral. I don't know if any like old school New Yorkers are in the, in the house, but you remember the Spiral on Houston in the basement. I know a few of you do. And, um, and then we played and we, yeah, that was sort of like, we just drove up or I think we took the bus and just borrowed gear. And then we played some well, shows in DC that remind, summer. Let's remind people, especially my students, this wasn't as easy as picking up a cell phone or sending a text to somebody in New York or, no. or him sending one to you to say, do you want to come play this bill? Got to write a letter and put it in the mail. It takes about a week. To get there. A lot of money on a phone call. Like phone calls weren't <laughs> cheap. <laughs> Pockets of quarters. To make this happen, mm -hmm. you've got to really want it, right? You can't put things on Spotify and then somebody finds your Instagram and books you into a showcase. You've got to well, really the other want thing, it. However, the friend, you, you would do all that work and you still didn't, nothing guaranteed that the, anyone would be there. And, you know, as we, you know, started touring more right. and, and playing around the country, you know, the, the dad joke equivalent of, of my, my friends, it's like, we're very comfortable playing in social distance because yeah, sure. <laughs> when you would come to our shows. <laughs> COVID compliant. <laughs> Even back then. Um, yeah. I was saying that Brian Mobile ends up being a little more than just a punky three piece right? with with three precocious uh, females banging away on their instruments. Um, right. I've been listening last night. I was up at like 3.30 and I couldn't get back to sleep. I have twin three-year-olds. Oh, no. So I was like, you know, put my headphones on and, uh, and rock out a little bit. Um, first of all, it still holds up. Um, Thanks. Unfortunately, it's still extraordinarily relevant. And I don't know if you expected that to be the case, but how does it then morph from this almost accidental punk band into, you know, what we now know looking back as the Riot Girl movie. You know, I mean, you're kind of on the, mm -hmm. you're on the working end of that, um, you know, into a lot of headwind, I imagine. How does it go from A to B? And then what's that like in that moment? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, we didn't have data in the same way that we think about it now, right? We think about, we have, and this week especially, right? Monday, many studies and research projects were released about, you know, the current state of various segments of our industry and the, I would argue, still woeful reality that, that some of the, you know, situations in terms of representation of women are in, and, you know, I think the approach when we started, you know, writing our fanzines and writing our, um, writing songs and playing them was 
just was like production oriented. Like we just wanted to do things. It was like the, we wanted to like, we thought our, our best friends were playing shows. So we wanted to play shows too, you know, and, and we wanted to go to shows. And a lot of this was, yeah, just like a ruse to travel, you know, and see new places. Right. And um, in my career, I've been very fortunate to be able to keep that ruse up um, until a year ago. Um, and, and so what, what it's hard, I think now is to look at, we didn't have the same sort of like analysis of the facts in music as we do now. And, and, and it's in 2021, it is good to feel like we are taking measurement of the facts and we are looking at what the, the reality that we are dealing with is, but it is painful to think about 25 years of the music industry, 30 years, 50 years, whatever, whatever segment you want to look at and how much economic value has been lost, how much opportunity has been lost, what that looks like, what that means to humanity. <laughs> I mean, I, I know that that's like a stretch, but it is like something that is very difficult for me to, you know, really wrap my head around, um, you know, yeah. where you see improvements and you see a tremendous number of ta you know, incredible talent, um, but it is not in anywhere near balance. And, and what does that mean for, for, you know, how much work there remains to do? So like, I'm so proud of being a part of that community and having been a part of a catalyst for that conversation, by the way, it was sensationalism then, right? Like it was on, they asked us to be on Sally, Jesse, Raphael, and that kind of shit, oh, like, you know, it was <laughs> like, you know, and I think that. I didn't do that, but I remember them calling me and they were like, we'd like you to come talk about the music industry. And I was like, literally, I don't know anything about the music industry. I'm, you know, in my apartment in Olympia, Washington, trying to graduate. Um, and, and now, you know, literally 30 years later, thinking about what kind of conditions we're in, it's, it's a little bit tough. There was almost um, shock that there were young women that didn't like the way things were and were singing songs about it and were angry about it. It was things. like the most and basic think, analysis, right? Like you just hate men. It was a, it was like that. That right. was the and narrative. Come on the daytime you know? television show. We're gonna have a woman hater going to join us at the next break. That's, yes. Right. And I remember yeah. being I wasn't that into it. I wasn't interested. <laughs> no, of course not. Um <laughs> And, and we're, you keep talking about zines. I think it's so funny because that's one of the things I think is just a culture break. You know, I always, the young kids will never know, but really you'll never know that to find the underground secret punk show, you had to go to the record store before somebody stole the zine. You had to go read it and, you know, either rip the page out or write it down if you could remember a pen, which you never did. I, I like a Sharpie. I still have one. I would like write it on my jeans. So I wouldn't forget, um, but you had to go when it came out before someone ripped it off. Otherwise you didn't know where the show was. You know, you couldn't go online. There was no bands in town or anything like that. So organizing is more challenging, but you're also much more passionate about getting all these things together. It's true. It's a funny, like I see Michelle Schacht who I'm a huge inspiration to me just posted about when the locust were on Jerry Springer and it, like in, Springer, in another yeah. sort of constellation of my life and connectivity, I managed the Locust for a few years, um, which was sort of like my, really? when I, I did management in the early 2000s and um, they were one of my oh, favorite bands. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about transitioning from anti-establishment punk pioneer to fat cat establishment lay person. And, and then I think on your label, did you have Ted Leo on the pharmacist and the Donna's? Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the trajectory of that was, you know, if we want to like summarize the nineties, you know, obviously many people can look at the chart of, you know, revenue and, you know, how the industry was growing and, 
getting up to the peak um, and then falling off a cliff, arguably a cliff, but you know, one or two years very quick. And um, so in that time, we were, you know, able to work with lots of artists and lots of um, art, the, we sort of pivoted a little bit as a label from maybe the genre that was originally associated with Lookout into things that were more reflective of sort of where our tastes were evolving. And um, and Ted Leo was one of those artists, Pretty Girls Make Graves, um, and then and the Donnas. And the Donnas are a Bay Area band. They were in high school when we, and we started playing shows with them. My, my other band called the Peaches had been playing, had played some shows with them with their project project band, the Electric Hues. So they, it's funny, they argue that the Donnas were the project band and the Electric Hues were their real band because they wrote those songs, <laughs> which is a funny thing to think about, but true. Like, you know, um, they they wrote, they didn't write the first Donnas record, but they they wrote the rest of them. And, um, and we started, we became friends and they started to work with us and they were, you know, 18, just out of high school. Um, and things started to happen for them. And they, you know, got, you know, magazine covers and lots of attention and flown to New York for this one and that one. And um, and it was just clear that, you know, they needed support. Um, they had a business manager, which is sort of unusual for a lot of the bands that we worked with. You know, they didn't actually have much infrastructure. And we, right. so the, their business manager and I, sort of decided eventually to join forces and start a management company together. And that became my, I guess that was probably like 99, um, sort of my half my time. And it worked out because we had the Donna's catalog and it was, it made sense to help them grow their career. And also sort of the, my band broke up pretty much when, I guess maybe four years in, you know, right when we were about like 23. And part of it was we just were like normal humans who didn't have a lot of like, we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know how to talk to each other. We didn't have any help, um, you know, life challenges of like becoming an adult and like, it's, you know, what are the things that you're trying to, to navigate? We didn't have any tools. Right. So we're just like, okay, F you, we're done. And very dramatic. And um, I was sort of, sure. When I saw that, you know, I started working with these four girls who, you know, had a lot of potential um, in different ways than we did, I think, um, in terms of the kind of music they wrote and played and the way that they presented it. Um, I was specifically interested in helping them, you know, not decombust, right? Like deconstruct. Um, you saw some of that. Your, De decombust isn't a word, but yeah. <laughs> What's that? But you saw some of your past in in them. In, in yeah, them, like no, I just, I knew up. that, you know, it was as simple as like, if I could do something to help avoid, like we still needed, you know, women rock and roll icons, you know? And if I could be a part of helping that group navigate the, you know, in the music industry without deconstructing, then that would be, that was very much, you know, connected to my values and where I, I had gotten my start. And, um, and so we did that from until about 2006, pretty much. Um, and did you have management history or management experience before them locally? Just working at the label and, you know, being them sort of like someone who has talking to recently, oh, I did uh, Jeff Mayfield's class and he was like, you're the done mother of the the group and I was like yeah so like I had that vibe right because I was the woman running at the label um I had a partner who was a woman and and someone else too but um you know we were I just had that instinct like yeah maybe like you the way you put it organizing um and had been part of their marketing and other sort of creative life for so long that you know with my partner Joey him managing sort of the business and the finances and all of the, the details um, around what became a pretty, pretty real, you know, operation when we started touring more and more. And, and you know, we ended eventually signed to Atlantic and that whole infrastructure required a lot more management. They had 
a huge night when they played on SNL. Yeah. The Donna. <laughs> how did that come to pass? Um, put that one together. Patty how Conti that... and Nick Stern at Atlantic um, and all the strings you have to pull to to get on SNL right. for release week. <laughs> the gig of all gigs. I mean, that's not It was a big deal. Um, our host was Ray Liotta and I'm like something wild is one of my favorite movies of all time. So that was like, for me, a big deal. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else really cared. Um, and um, yeah, they played on TRL on Monday and then we were in town for the rest of the week. And then they played SNL on Saturday and um, it was super, super cold that week in New York and very bizarre, you know, like a really wild, you know, wild to think about what that's we were, we were dealing with. For, that's a very surreal fun. week for any mm -hmm. band. Mm -hmm. you know, um, TRL, some people have forgotten, but TRL was the biggest thing happened between noon and, and the primetime shows every day. Mm -hmm. um, not just even in the music industry, like in TV, it was one of the highest rated shows. Yeah. And then to go from that and to SNL in a week is massive. Um, yeah. you, you know, you keep accidentally ending up on top and I have a feeling it's not an accident. Um, so, you know, your band, your bands have a through line that still, you know, goes through the Donnas. Uh, obviously, Bikini Kill is kind of standing there next to you at, at the forefront, but you can still see that happening. The Sleater Kinney and, you know, the Pussy Riot Band all across the world. Um, you can see your DNA having been put out there. Do you, do you think that the movement still has legs? Obviously, it still has import and relevance. Does it still have momentum? <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. I had someone send me a, um, like a, an album master yesterday, a woman manager, um, who's, who's got, you know, a band and I, and she sent it to me and she said, I think you'll like this. And I listened to it for a bit and it was very much in the vein of, you know, straightforward rhythm, pretty melodic, some kind of like, you know, like a vocal of, you know, with a point of view. And, um, and I was like, she thinks I'd like it because this is what my band was like. And it was certainly interesting to think about, you know, in, in the stage of life that I'm in now, and like, you know, how I would approach and, you know, certainly I listen to a lot more kids bop than I would want to hope, you know, perhaps, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's interesting because I don't there I don't observe there to be a real scene in that way around you know right girl or feminist mm -hmm. music and but I also don't have a lot of visibility to it so it's very possible there was a woman I met at an at a NYU class when I was working at Kickstarter and she came up to me after the class and she's like oh we ran a, a Kickstarter last year for our there was, they did a festival on Governor's Island, I think, and they had run a campaign. And um, and it was just really interesting because I felt like a lot of connection to her from kind of what you're describing, but I don't know too much about that right now. Let's, uh, thank you for the easy transition. Let's talk about Kickstarter. You were the honcho of music at Kickstarter, the first one. Mm -hmm. um, what led you from you now you had gone from punk from acoustic guitarist to punk drummer to uh some infographic here icon. right cj can we work on that <laughs> <laughs> uh brief stop at, at, at uh online mp3 store called emusic and then kickstarter what was the pitch that got you to take that job what did you think you would be doing and what did you end up doing at Kickstarter? Um, great question. So I had been working at H2IM and was the interim president um, and had, you know, 
put forward my candidacy for the for the role of you know president and um about the same time that i said i'd like to officially you know be considered um my one of my good friends who was a co-founder and ceo at the time uh, of kickstarter yancy strickler um and the the vp of community operations at 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 the company, Kendall Ratley, Kendall Shore, um, reached out to me and I was like, this is weird timing. I don't know that I should be talking. <laughs> like, you know, I just, I I just got, how it was, you know, the board had sort of entrusted me to manage the, com the organization in the interim while the search was on. And I, um, you know, really did think that that was my path. And I had sort of approached my job at HYM thinking that that was like, I was going home and this was the place for me trying to tie all the things that I had learned. And it is a job that is you pretty much 24 seven, you know, it's just like never, so at it never. Just to make sure everybody yeah. understands you are, yes. you go from working from talking your way into an indie label to organizing that indie label then saying we should all organize indie labels. Well, Let's I was part together, of that group right? that became the the founding board of of HYM. Yeah, um, which was a very sort so of again the like call. Mm -hmm. You all um, get together now. The indies have banded together, and you're organizing these folks until you can find someone to take over. Uh, your natural inclinations for for organization keeps coming up in all of this work-life balance that that you're striving Funny, for yeah. And, and, yeah and so you're you're ready to take that leap over to kickstarter you were just saying thought maybe this isn't the best time well it was i my daughter was very young and um and we were at that point managing a situation with the copyright royalty board where there had been some conflicts amongst the music community and I was sort of managing the, you know, all the politics that, you know, um, I had visibility into in that role. And um, so again, back to my like real roots and it was just really demanding and really an intense commitment that at the end of the day with where I was with my family and, you know, all of those things, I, I realized that it was not really the right time for me to have that um that level of commitment and um and the opportunity at kickstarter was interesting because it was a resourced company it was a little different than a nonprofit. um it was still very mission driven um but it was not in music and that fact was i think quite important as a as a chance to sort of think about new things and think about um a different ways companies can be structured different way teams can be structured so I was only there for two years, but um, it was a pretty quick growth spurt in terms of reimagining, you know, how how companies and teams and and you know leaders can be, um, you know, considered and what work is involved and required to to do that well, um, and and so you know, Tom started with you know Joe. Um, Joe's call. Um, so Justin Cliffowitz, who um, you know is the CEO of Downtown Music, um, and I had become friendly over the years, and um, you know, sort of in my role at HYM primarily because they were downtown, and Justin have already always been very involved in you know different initiatives around um, tax credits for studios and other sort of. He's very very proud of New York. And so he loves anything that can sort of connect our work to to New York um, with the greatest city in the world. And he, um, so we just had become, you know, we would have breakfast once in a while and 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 catch up. And I, I knew that I was sort of ready to explore new opportunities. And I'm sure I didn't plant that seed very subtly but maybe I did, I don't know. We never talked about that. But um, about three weeks after the last time we got together, he was like, can you come in and talk about song trust? Would you be interested at all? And and I, you know, he is just someone that I had on a very short list of people that I would have been 
excited to work for. I'm not going right. to say that I wouldn't have worked for lots of people, um, but I was like, I want to work for this person or a couple of others, you know, like, you know, pretty short list I, of, of people that I, I take felt very aligned I'm in my values to. with. What's that? Yeah. I'm happy to shoot myself in the foot. So I say online all the time that you and Joe are maybe the only people in the service side of the industry that I would work for or with <laughs> at this point. Um, oh, and thank so you I very much. Why you would say about yeah. being, um, the best dressed man in publishing. Well, this is I, I, not no not to disparage Joe, but I was talking about Justin, um, uh, oh. who yeah. So who, Justin is the I I didn't know Joe very well when I started um, at you know Song Trust. I started to um, you know he and I started to work together then. Justin was um, the person that I had been working sort of become to know, sure. um, and um, and so. Yeah, it was it was an interesting task because I didn't work in publishing before and I had to learn, but it was a pretty good, you know, and I think a, a, certainly a leap of faith on their part in certain ways. Uh, but, um, you know, I'm really, really proud of what we've done together the last three years. And, um, you know, when yeah, I became I president, so. that's uh, about a year ago, um, you know, we've we've certainly our business is, you know, I always kind of joke about it being like a, or like a, you know, credit karma or, you know, tax, whatever, you know, the tax software for, for music publishing, like it's not work you want to do, but it is necessary. <laughs> and, um, and so we have been, you know, that trying to make the information that makes it necessary available has been a big you know, sort of, you know, so, so what we've been trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a year ago when, when we all, you know, went home, many people were like, okay, I'm going to do my taxes. Maybe I'll look into song trust. So that was good for us. And I, you know, sort of, right. and, and also the, con our main client base is, you know, skews heavily digital. Um, and so the consumption trends of the last year have also benefited our clients, um, you know, even though, it's publishing and sometimes the royalty, um, you know, the time to royalties can be um, a little bit longer than many people are used to. And that sometimes is also challenging because people are used to like putting music on distribution platforms and then getting a check or cut, you know, in a month. And that's just not how publishing works. And so that can be a little right. bit difficult, but, um, but you know, we're, we're weathering it. We're, we're, we're doing our best to get ahead of it. Well, more than weather. Tom said you have two million songs under control. I, I think you've got three at this point, right? Or if yeah, we just so we just with, uh, announced that three million. So it's it's um it's in it's tremendous, and it's a lot. You know, it's a lot Literally. for societies. It's a lot for pay, you know all the digital services, as the headlines indicate. You know, with the unmatched um, pool that will be distributed and allocated soon. You know, this is a is this a a complicated beast of the seg segment of the industry, um, yeah. which sometimes I'm like, whoa, what did, I, what did I say? I wanted to work with Justin. Did I know what the hell I was getting into? <laughs> <laughs> well, that brings us up to current day. So I want to ask you about the future a little bit. Um, pushing was in the news a lot at the end of last year, middle to end of last year, with luminary writers saying, portions or the entirety of massive catalogs, right? Are those in your mind standalones because of who they were? You know, Stevie Nicks, Bob Dylan, uh, David Crosby, or is that an indication of a trend of the value of pushing in general? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, or I think that I, I you know, I mean, I think it's been very validating to songwriters and composers fundamentally that their work has, you know, you know, massive, you know, arguably, you know, what wonderful value. I don't know how, how you want to characterize it. Um, whether what conditions sort of like supported those transactions specifically, 
I'm sure there's lots of opinions and I don't know that I need to posit mine. I think the way I think about where I live in that ecosystem is obviously what we're trying to offer in our company is the chance for you to have the sort of control over the work that you create and um, autonomy about decisions. And so when I look at those transactions of people who have given their lives to their work and at some point decide that this is the right call, I feel very cool with that, that that is their right. call. Um, I have less comfort with people who sign prohibitive or restrictive agreements very early in their career that then they have very dramatic you know, situations um, that have also been in the headlines in the last year. And so yeah. I like to think about the work that we do kind of, I have, if, if someone wants to sign a contract or put themselves, you know, and, and work with a company in, a, in that way, I, it's, that's their call. And I, I think that's perfectly fine. But knowing that there are other options and there are more and more every day and the headlines, you know, other headlines support those facts. Um, I think it's, it's a really interesting time to, to sort of be in rights management space. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, for better or worse, I guess, depending on what side of it you find yourself on. Um, right. It's, it's about, whatever your life goes. What my, about, I, I think the one trend you can also lead, you know, read through my career is like, I've never been really about the big payday for better or worse. I, I'm sure it would be nice, but sure. that's not been my, my main motivation, you know, so. Hey, what about the future for the world of indies? I, I say all the time, it's never been easier to be, you know, uh, a musician to release, meaning distribute your music. It's also never been easier to call yourself a record label right? Mm -hmm. The three of mm -hmm. us could form one before we end the call if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Where do you mm -hmm. see the future of legit, real, not the Mindies as we call them, right? Not controlled, but individualized major Indies, but like legitimate Indie labels. Is there a space left for them to grow into, in your opinion? I think absolutely. You know, there is so much that we don't consider. We're always struggling for the context of why something's interesting and you know while i i you know i sort of resist a lot the thinking that anyone's like a a a r and a and r genius you know in that or anyone has the secret ear the golden ears or whatever but um but there is something to be said for community and networks and discovery that is you know sort of informed by itself and that's certainly sure. very much for the indie label of the size I think you're kind of describing that I was a part of and that my most of my friends and my creative friends have been a part of. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot to be said, like we're struggling so bad right now to figure out what is the, what's the music to listen to because of the volume, 60,000 tracks a day, how, what, what's good, you know? So you have to right. do some work and a playlist, sure, curated by a company, sure, but there is something to be said for something other than that. And um, and so I think that there definitely is, like, um, there is space for that. Trying to, to track the signal through the noise. I, I read something that you said in an interview that I think is brilliant. I'm, I'm going to start putting it everywhere. You can't program the culture. Um, I want to know okay. what you th what that means to you, <laughs> and then I want to see because that resonates with everybody else too. After that, one final question, and then and we'll let you go. What did you mean by that? You can't program the culture. Where did, what was the context of saying that? Do you remember? You, I don't remember saying that. Someone was asking you about this is like an interview you did in two thousand six, two thousand eight, maybe. Somebody was asking you about whether or not you still liked going to shows and whether or not you found anything that, you, that resonated with you in the current, then current punk pop scene. Right, I'm just trying to think about what the programming was now, because saying that then versus 
you know, the playlisting world that we're all an algorithmic world that we're all, you know, <laughs> navigating is totally different, right? But I, I mean, I, I, I guess the way I think about that now, I don't know if I, you know, that would come top of mind, but is, you know, that we're, there's community, um, you know, experience, how we share it is there is a truth to it. There is like an energy to it, I guess, if we really want to go back to my crystals days, you know, and, and there's, there is something that, you know, you can't have fed to you. Certainly. I mean, I see a lot of like, I have the brand new AI company and we can work with you this way. And, and a lot of those, you know, I don't want to shut any doors to those possibilities because we, none of us predicted, I'm sure that we would be in this situation, you know, by any, you know, measure, nobody predicted this. Um, so I try not to be too like, oh, that I'll never do that. You know, even if I might think it, um, <laughs> I, I, tr I try to resist it. Um, but I think there is like, and I, I would argue that the world we're experiencing now, like I would love to chat with you all in person and, you know, have a beverage after and talk. And we are now in this very guided, formed way that's like totally fine and we're making do, but there is something certainly that we all know we're not able to understand about each other. It's wonderful to see so many friends' names here, um, but it's not as good as seeing them in person. And, and so no. I guess that kind of connects to that idea. And there's something that makes the resonance of a performance an album, a song, a show different when you're all together and it's all hot and sweaty and someone's hold a beer on your foot than just uh, the algorithm. You just, gave, it, you just gave everybody like a weird, you know, like anxiety attack because everybody's, you know, nobody knows how they're going to go to a, a crowded sweaty show ever again. Right, <laughs> right. You know, whereas no, the computer, the algorithm is feeding me what they think I'm going to be interested in. You know, right. and it's right. very different. Whereas before, to find things, I had to find it because attached to something else that I liked or, or I thought had credibility, right? Or a guy or a gal who knew this band and I thought they had taste. So I was going to check it right. out too, right? right. Or a patch right. on someone's jacket that I thought was cool. So I'll, you know, I'll keep that in mind. Uh, all right. <laughs> We're a little over, but I want to ask one final question because all of these steps that you've taken to get yourself to where you are, uh, they don't seem like they're individually calculated to lead to this point. Is mm -hmm. there anything back there in the past that wasn't fortuitous, that you have done differently, that, that you think may have been a mistake or, or even something you thought was a mistake in that time, but proved mm -hmm. to be actually a benefit to you? Well, you know, our label didn't work out. Our label, we had to shut down. We ran out of money. We owed, we had to pay bills and, you know, came short. And that was extremely painful and extremely difficult mm. to, um, to, to go through. And it, it has been the thing that I think about almost every day, never wanting to have to go through again. Mm. Not that I think necessarily that I might not have to someday, you know, we have to make tough choices and, and there's things don't, you know, this is a volatile environment we're all living in right now, but um, we were operating without the right balance of expertise. I'll just put it that way, you know, like I had never managed a PL in the same way that, you know, was required and to look at, you know, revenue and expense and balance and, you know, what, and, and so with the volatility of, you know, how much, how many, how, how, you know, the, the health of the business of like record selling or CD selling at the margins they had in the nineties and then that disappearing, um, you know, we, I, we weren't the only company that didn't make it through, but um, right. that certainly was something that to, to be responsible in your planning um, and to think about the long-term and to be thoughtful about your business, I think is, is important. And some people might say, well, that's not very punk. Um, and, and I disagree because I think 
to the people who think that punk is about not caring, that that couldn't be further from the truth. Punk is about yeah. making sure that you're caring about the things that are important to you and voicing yeah. that even in the face of opposition. And I think you've done that consistently, making all the choices you've made. You're still the original rock girl. You're still making sure that what you do rings true to who you are. Uh, and I think that shows through all the time. So, um, well, I, I appreciate that very much. That's there. very sweet. I, I want to come to the city and buy beers when we all can, which I think is close. And we can get to a loud, gross, sweaty punk show uh, somewhere down in the village or something like that. Uh, and, and just let it wash over us like the, the panacea yeah, we need. So I hope so. Out. I hope so. Thank yeah. you so much, Holly. And, thank and you, Tom, Kevin. And thank, thank you, you Tom. Me... Hey, this has and been a pleasure. And friends for joining us. Yeah, thanks. This has been a yeah, pleasure. Thanks, everybody to put on and to watch and you know kevin you, you once again are such a masterful interviewer drawing out things that molly had even forgotten that she had said <laughs> molly <laughs> i think you, the are, is, you can't program the culture molly, <laughs> you continue Again. to amaze you are an inspiration Aww, to me you <laughs> um, and i i'm just thrilled to have you among my friends and thrilled to celebrate you here on this platform to the audience, yeah. I want to thank you for your time. I want to encourage you to keep coming back the entire month of March. We're celebrating rock stars like Molly. Tomorrow, we're celebrating two of her friends from the publishing world, Terry Nelson Carpenter and Nina yes. Raguwansi, which- um, That'll be gonna, great. It's going to be fabulous. So tune in at the same time. Tell your friends about it. And I want to conclude by simply saying, be nice to one another. Everyone get a shot and wear a mask. Talk to you soon, folks. Thank you. Bye.